So my name is Naomi Ear. I'm the CEO of the Charney Forum for New Diplomacy. And I want to thank everyone for joining our panel. Uh, hopefully, we should be getting more than 100 participants. We've had over 200 people register, so I'm hoping they'll make their way um, slowly but surely. So our panel, Roots of Ruths, Women Pursuers of Justice, uh, is about to start. Just a few words about the Charney Forum and a few introductions, and then we will go to the main event. The Charney Forum for New Diplomacy, in collaboration with the University of Haifa, offers workshops, seminars, and events with top-notch speakers and experts, presenting a wide range of perspectives about complex issues and providing practical tools to navigate the information overload. The global crisis created by COVID-19 exacerbates the disruption caused by the digital revolution, increasing the need to address the many challenges created. Information overload, hyperconnectivity, social media, and countless news feeds have led to sectarian discourse, fake news, and echo chambers. Here with us today is Tilly Charney, who spearheaded the Charney Forum for New Diplomacy a couple of years ago on the tail end of the previous era to deal with the overload of information. Tilly aspires to promote open, diverse, and effective civil discourse amongst people and between organizations. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Tilly for enabling us to do such incredible and important work, as well as our chairman, Ido Aroni, and the Charney Forum's dedicated staff, Einat Hakim and Maya Fintz. Our mission at the Charney Forum focuses on the importance of listening and recognizing diverse narratives, expanding our echo chambers. Our last panel was dedicated to the important issue of Black Lives Matter, presenting diverse narratives from Israel and the US. In an attempt to try to keep up with the high-paced current events, we decided to dedicate this panel to extraordinary women including two legal giants who passed away recently, leaving a huge void. Indeed, America and Israel lost two powerful champions for human rights with the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Professor Ruth Gavison. The call for justice is a recurring theme along the entire Jewish tradition. A small anecdote, on our office wall, our RBG had a poster with the biblical commandment of Tzedek Tzedek Tirdof, justice, justice, you shall pursue. So this is also, as you know by now, the theme that we chose for this conversation, celebrating the legacy of three Ruths. Our esteemed panelists will each present one prominent Ruth. We will leave time at the end for a Q&A and ask that you please write your questions in the chat box, which we will review and select a few as time will permit. Please, we also ask that you notice at the end, we are gonna put a link for a feedback form and we would really appreciate if you could take just two minutes to fill it out. It helps us learn and improve for next events. And now, before we hand over the mic to our speakers, I'd like to introduce my colleague from the Forum for Gender, Law and Policy, Dr. Shlomit Lil, who worked hard with me to put this together and will co out and will co moderate the panel with me. Dr. Lear is a gender and new media specialist who writes on issues concerning social justice and women's rights in Israeli society. She's a lecturer at Ben Gurion University and a senior researcher at the Forum for Gender, Law and Policy. Take it away, Shlomit once I unmute you. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm very happy to participate in this event and celebrate the lives of three exceptional women leaders, women who were able in different periods of time to write themselves into history, history, or in this case, into her story. Women who inspired others and made the world in many ways a better place let me start by introducing the Forum for Gender, Law and Policy. The Forum was established in 2014 with the goal of changing the landscape of feminist legal research and activism in Israel. This year, the Forum was able to expand its activity significantly thanks to the generous support of Ms. Ora Stibe and the Anata Foundation. We are enormously grateful to Ora for this support and make some more feminist initiatives possible by that support. The Forum serves as the first academic platform of its kind for the advancement of research, legal training, community outreach, and public policy initiatives surrounding topics of gender inequality in Israel. As part of our mission, of bringing together academia and field activism, we recently publicized a declaration of girls' rights in Hebrew and Arabic. And you are all welcome to view it on our website or on our Facebook page. 
As Noah mentioned, each of our distinguished speakers will portray one pursuer of justice, sharing insight into her inspirational roles. And we'll begin with Professor Shulamit Almog, who will discuss the biblical roots. Professor Almog is a full professor of law at Haifa University. She was visiting professor at many leading universities worldwide. Her research focused on law and literature, law and narrative, feminism, and children's rights. In recent years, her work has inspired parliament bills concerned with reforming the treatment of prostitution in Israeli law and protecting employees against bullying. She published eight books and more than 80 articles in American, Canadian, European, and Israeli law reviews. Professor Almog, the floor is yours. One second. Can you press unmute? I, I pressed it for some reason, it's not going through. Sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> Should, okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, is it okay now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, hello everybody again. Uh, th and thank you, Shlomit, for this kind introduction. Um, I'm going to open this special event with a woman that shines from a very distant past, biblical root. In Hebrew, Rut HaMoavia. Apropos Hebrew, a preliminary remark. During this uh, short presentation, I will mostly use for names and places, I will mention the original phonetic pronunciation, which is, of course, the biblical one, trusting that uh, all of you English speakers are quite familiar with these Hebrew versions of the names. So to the first root, an extraordinary boundary breaking woman, a statusless immigrant that becomes the great grandmother of the greatest king of Israel. How does Ruth manage to bypass restrictive norms and create a new reality for herself? To defy social conventions and pave her own path? Well, the story begins as follows. A family from Yehuda immigrates to Moab because of an economic crisis, a famine. Naomi, Elimelech and their two sons. Firstly, it all goes well. And the two sons marry local girls named Orpa and Ruth. And then disaster strikes. The father and his two sons die. The morning Naomi decides to return home to Beit Lechem, where she has relatives and a slim chance to regain a family property. She urges Ruth and Opa to remain in Moab with their parental families. Opa stays there, but Ruth refuses with these famous resounding words, Ki el asher tilchi elech, uva asher talini alin, amech ami, veeloheich, elohai. The two arrive to Bethlehem, to the estate of Boaz, a distant and wealthy relative of the family. They make a meager living from roots gleaning the leftovers in the oat field. So they merely survive. But they want more than that from life. And Nomi puts forward a plan that openly subverts under societal norms. She convinces Ruth to take control and to actively shape the course of events. Ruth agrees. And this is how she acts. She waits for Boaz to fall asleep in the granary, lies down at his feet, and waits for him to wake up. 
It is not clear what exactly happened then and if sex was involved, maybe, maybe not. We are not told about it very clearly. But it is clear the truth chose to make an offer and that Boaz accepted it. And then they get married. And then Ruth gives birth to a son. This son is Oved, the father of Ishai, who is the father of Hamelech David, King David. What emerges from this intriguing biblical story about a woman who dared to take initiative to act? Well, like many other deep and layered narrative, this narrative too allows for many readings. The story certainly exposes how oppressive and abusive for women life was then. Just a few examples for that I could bring much more. Ruth and uh, Naomi must pursue male sponsorship and protection in order to survive. Ruth can choose to go to Bethlehem with Naomi, but the price of this choice is to give up her religion and heritage. A woman is redeemed only by giving birth. For sure, it is important to notice these angles of this story, these disturbing angles of this story. But to me, the dominant element that powerfully paints this story to this day is the way it highlights Ruth's and Naomi power to take control of their life, their astounding agency. Notice, for instance, how many expectations Ruth had defined, how brave she was, how many barriers she overcame. She chose to marry a foreigner. After his death, she chose to leave her privileged status and immigrate with her mother to the with her mother-in-law to the unknown, to a foreign land. Then she chose a new partner before he chose her and offered him a relationship. Out of personal strength and composure, she managed to play a bold strategic game that overcame the existing rules and limitations and established new ones. And the Bible made this woman a key figure within King David's dynasty. Even today, it is hard to think of a more challenging message. Ruth's character can still serve as a model that is needed today, perhaps more than ever, for the immense power of female agency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Almog, for these inspiring words. The story of the biblical Ruth emphasizes the importance of bold women who left their mark on the world, thus becoming a source of inspiration for uh, generations to come. Our next speaker is the prominent Israeli journalist Anat Saragusti. Anat's extensive experience include being the former CEO of Agenda, Israeli Center for Strategic Communication. Saragusti is a news editor, reporter, photographer, peace activist, and human rights advocate. She is founding mem member of Tai Tonayot, a group of leading women in the Israeli media, and currently she is the press freedom coordinator at the Union of Journalists in Israel. Anat Saragusti will share her insight into Ruth Gavizon, professor of law and expert of human rights and the recipient of the Israel Prize. Anat, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shlomit. Thank you, everybody. And thank you so much for inviting me to join this panel, even though I'm not a scholar. So I feel privileged to be with you all. I also want to say that I didn't know Ruth Gavizon personally. I may have interviewed her during my career as a journalist, but that's all. On the other hand, I was her student during my first year at law school. She taught me the philosophy of law 
And I must say, it was an eye-opening course. She was so energetic, invested, devoted to teaching, and engaged in the subject that I can still picture her on the stage, running and jumping from one side to the other, shooting examples, principles, and values towards us. For that, I will always be thankful. Ruth Gabison was a person of contradictions. She was born to a family that was four generations in the country, yet she was a woman of the world and got her PhD from the University of Oxford. She was, she was one of the first law professors to join the Association for Civil Rights in Israel, ACRI, and for a few years served as its chairperson and president. During her tenure, at ACRI, ACRI petitioned to the High Court of Justice mainly on security issues. The most famous one was the petition against the deportation of 400 Hamas operatives during Rabin's government in 1992. Later, she vocally criticized ACRI for filing petitions that were challenging issues of state security. She expressed her strong opinion that these were the matters that should not be led by the Association of Civil Rights, and that there are issues that the High Court of Justice should not rule on. She was then criticized for neglecting the discourse of human rights. Gabizon was mostly known for the serious attempts to draft a comprehensive covenant that will settle the relations between the Jewish communities in Israel on state and religious religion issues. This was a mutual work she did with uh, Rabbi Yaakov Meidan. They worked on this document for three years with others, trying to reach an agreement between secular and religious Jews. When this covenant was published almost two decades ago, it was a center of a vibrant discussion among civil rights, human rights scholars, and other members of the legal community. Many appreciated their efforts, but others strongly argued that they do not represent anybody and that Professor Gabizon had no standing to speak on behalf of the secular community in Israel and give up rights on behalf of, of the LGBTQ community. This document reflected another side of the contradictions of Professor Gabizon. Eventually, as you may already understand, the covenant created a public debate, but was not adopted by any state agency. Yet Gabizon continued to echo its principles in her dynamic Facebook account until her last days. In the last years, she created another dispute when she promoted Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people, which was also controversial among her colleagues in the liberal community. Because she was a woman of contradictions, she was not part of any community. Maybe that was the, the reason that she was not nominated to be a justice at the Supreme Court, and the mere idea created such a strong pushback. She did not have a camp that supported her nomination, and there was a strong camp that strongly opposed her because she was seen as unpredictable. One could not place her in any collective group. She was a soloist player. This was her strength and her weakness. She played only according to her own tune. For that, she was unique and exceptional. She was a woman of integrity, she had no personal interest and gained no personal benefit. She managed to keep a strong position, which she did not hesitate to express, even when it was not very popular. And she usually vocally explained all the arguments that supported her opinion in a comprehensive way. She was extremely clever and intelligent. It is not easy to hold an independent opinion that does not align with your peer group. And for that, she should be praised and remembered. This is why her persona is very, is very inspiring to women, to anyone who wants to be a player in the public discussion. 
this, her, this is her outstanding legacy. Thank you very much, Anat, for uh, these encouraging words that allow us to think of the ability to be oneself while promoting significant social change. Uh, our third speaker is Professor Noya Rimat, who will discuss the celebrated Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a flaming feminist litigator, as she described herself. Professor Noya Rimat is the co-founding director of the Forum for Gender Law and Policy at the University of Haifa. In recent years, she was visiting professor at the University of Toronto Center for Ethics and a visiting faculty at Georgetown Law Center and the Washington College of Law at American University. Professor Rimat's scholarship examines the intersections of gender, law, and feminism in both legal theory and practice. Professor Rimald, the floor is yours. I've unmuted, but I need you to press it as well. There we go. Okay. <laughs> I think I'm, uh, I'm good now. So uh, thank you, Shlomit, uh, for your introduction. I am very, very happy to be part of this panel. And it's great uh, to see so many people uh, in the audience. Um, so much has been said and written about uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, this incredible woman, uh, since her death uh, slightly more than a month ago. Remarkably, uh, many focused on her long term as a Supreme Court justice uh, when uh, commemor commemorating her legacy. I prefer to focus on Ginsburg's early career uh, the decade between 1970 and 1980, when she was uh, litigating gender equality cases in court. Uh, in my opinion, uh, these years were more significant in terms of her contribution uh, to the promotion of women's rights. So uh, it was at the beginning of the 1970s uh, when the women's rights movement was really kicking into full gear and there was a lot of activism around uh, women's rights, but there wasn't yet really litigation challenging the numerous sex discriminatory laws uh, that existed. Until 1971, uh, the US uh, Supreme Court had interpreted the 14th Amendment to the Constitution that guarantees the equal protection of the laws as one that does not apply to women. The judicial reasoning was that the right to equality applies only to those who are essentially similar because women were perceived as significantly different from men. They were excluded from the principle of equal protection of the laws and subjected to a series of special and discriminatory uh, rules. RBG's ultimate goal was to undermine the stereotypical perceptions on which discriminatory distinctions between men and women were based. She understood that in a world where the feminine is labeled as fundamentally different and inherently inferior to the masculine, gender equality cannot be achieved. So if you're trying to understand what was RBG's ultimate goal in the 70s, it was undermining gender stereotypes that are particularly harmful for women. In 1971, a case, in a case called Reed v. Reed, the Supreme Court invalidated an Idaho statute that gave preference to men for appointment as administrators of a deceased person estate. In so doing, the court extended the Constitution's equal protection guarantee to women for the first time. For RBG and for other feminists of her generation, the Reed opinion was a call to arms. In 1972, the Women's Rights Project was established under RBG leadership. And for a decade, she led this project to a series of achievements in court. 
as a leading strategy, she chose to bring before the court cases in which the plaintiffs were men and not women, in a world where the vast majority of judges were white men, she was seeking to show the gendered stereotypical distinctions harm men as well as women, because these distinctions force both sexes into particular oppressive and disciplinary uh, gender roles. Um, the male judges were convinced and in a case after case, the court invalidated specific laws that distinguish between men and women. RBG assumed that once specific discriminatory obstacles are lifted, the same opportunities will be open to both sexes and men and women would be able to create new traditions by, by their own actions. Today, uh, when we are commemorating her legacy, it's important to ask how successful RBG was in promoting her vision of uh, gender equality. On the one hand, she was very effective in invalidating numerous legal rules that subjected men and women to a different treatment. RBG was a key player in pushing the American Supreme Court toward the establishment of the constitutional basis for prohibiting sex discrimination. However, her broader vision, that of a world in which men and women are no longer subjected to gender roles and stereotypical expectations this far-reaching vision was only partially accomplished. Therefore, the passing of this extraordinary woman is an opportunity not only to celebrate her past achievements, but also to look ahead and identify contemporary challenges in the ongoing struggle for gender equality and justice. So let's talk about the current state of gender equality, both in Israel and in the US. And let me share uh, some uh, relevant uh, data uh, with you. So uh, I'll try to share my uh, presentation. Um, OK. So um, the most recent Global uh, uh, Gender Gap Index uh, introduced by the World Economic Forum in 2020 evaluates both Israel and the United States performance in the area of gender equality as relatively poor. The index ranks Israel as number 63 out of 153 countries on the size of its gender gap. And as you can see, the United States is ranked 53. Even more troubling is the fact that both countries are moving backwards rather than forward. In the past 14 years, their ranking deteriorated significantly. This ranking is just another reminder of the fact the gender equality still remains out of reach in both uh, countries. Um, both American and Israeli women have made strikingly little progress in advancing to position of power and influence in politics or in the workforce. Consequently, they earn on average 70 cents to every dollar earned uh, by men for uh, a similar job. Um, in the current administration, women account for only 20% of cabinet members. In parliament, women account for less than 25% of its uh, uh, members. And I now I stop share. Okay. Um, so. So. Why is it? Why is it that after years of numerous uh, feminist struggles, so little has been gained? 
Uh, this question takes me back to the main obstacle to gender equality, the one that RBG clearly identified what, but was unsuccessful in fully removing. Contrary to what she had hoped 50 years ago, stereotypical perceptions still persist and portray the masculine and its traits as, some, as something that is inherently more suitable for positions of power, influence, and leadership in the public sphere. This is clearly why women have such a hard time to be elected or appointed to positions of power, why they're still perceived as less competent to lead a country, and why women's professional work is not considered as valuable as men's work. So the death of RBG is a reminder that the battle is not over yet and that we still have a long way to go. Moreover, to win this battle, women have to be joined by men. As RBG argued very forcefully decades ago, a world that is shaped by gender roles and stereotypes cannot fulfill the promise of freedom, justice, and equality for all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Imalt, for those, uh, for those remarks. And thank you to all of you, to Anat Salagusti and Professor Almog, for all those wonderful insights. Um, so to tie into what you just spoke about, uh, Professor Rimalt, um, I was going to say that the three, Ruth, the three Ruths that we discussed today share qualities of outstanding leadership, um, and yet it also needs to, of course, be recognized that there's still a long way to go from, from the things that they were fighting for. So my question is two parts. First part is how can we continue th their legacy? And to add to that question, um, recent history just uh, Recently, recent history was made when a woman of color was nominated as the first ever to run for vice president. When do you think we will finally see a female president in the US and another female prime minister in Israel? And I will let uh, Professor Rima, do you want to start? Um, okay. Um, so, um, when are we going to see a female president in the US? and a second female prime minister in Israel. Unfortunately, not in the very near future. I think this will happen only when women as a group uh, become um, a more significant uh, political power. Um, in the US, there are some indica indications that uh, the process has started. Um, in my opinion, uh, it is reflected in a clear gender gap in voting patterns. Uh, I don't know um, how many of you know, but since 1980, uh, the two genders have differed markedly in their preferences at the ballot box, uh, with women tending to choose candidates from uh, the Democratic Party more than men do. Um, the existence of a clear gender gap in American politics has two immediate uh, important consequences uh, for women. Uh, first, it makes American women an identified uh, political group whose interests are counted and considered as part of the general uh, political agenda. And second, gender gap increases the chances of American women to be elected to political office. Uh, relevant research uh, suggests that American women tend to prefer women with liberal agendas uh, to men with similar agendas. Um, as opposed to the United States, gender gap in voting has never been an issue in Israel. Israeli women traditionally voted as men and preferred men as leaders. Yet about a decade ago in, 2000, in the 2009 election, when Netanyahu was competing against Tsipi Livni, a possible change was recorded uh, for the first time. 
a clear gender gap has been identified among uh, Kadima voters. Uh, different polls found that more Jewish women than men voted for Kadima, led then, as I already mentioned, by uh, Tsipi Livni. Uh, similar trends were recorded, it were, were recorded in 2013 when some polls identified the gender gap among voters for parties from the center and the left who were then led by uh, women. Uh, these developments signal an important uh, but not sufficient change, in my opinion. Uh, gender gap in voting is still marginal in Israel. Uh, in the US, it's important uh, to be remembered uh, that uh, the 2016 election results showed that gender is not the only gap at work. An estimated 52% of white female voters chose Trump compared to only 4% of black women and 25% of Latino women. So if we want to see a female president or prime minister sometime soon, gender gap in, in voting is a key element in my opinion. As I already mentioned, one of the consequences of a gender gap is that more women are usually elected. And even more important, a critical mass of uh, women um, in a, a position of power uh, contributes more than anything else to the decrease of, of uh, gender stereotypes that associate femininity with uh, domesticity. And this conclusion takes me back to my earlier discussion of the significance of RBG legal work and to her leading assumption if we want to see female leaders dominating the political sphere, we need to make sure that we break the vicious cycle in which gender biases operate as a powerful mechanism for excluding women from management and the leadership uh, positions. Thank you very much. I'll now move the question to Professor Almog. Uh, feel free to respond to any of those about the first female president and second female prime minister, and also how do we continue that legacy? Well, um, my reply is going to be very brief because I, I think that in order to answer this question, we need prophecies. And unfortunately, I'm not a prophet. But I, I only, I'm, I'm only going to mention that in my view, what we need is a paradigm shift. We need several paradigms to be changed, to be dramatically changed. And uh, this will take me back to Ruth, because in my eyes, what she uh, represents is a paradigm shift uh, in terms of uh, sexuality. Uh, the way we perceive uh, the sexuality of women. It, it, this is why uh, the story of fruit is highly relevant to our days. In our culture, in, in the culture that uh, still belittles women uh, because of their sexuality, the links between female sexuality and shame, danger and uh, vulnerability it is difficult for women to dream about being prime ministers or presidents. But biblical root, Ruth HaMuaviyah, informs us that there's another paradigm, that another paradigm is possible. The new paradigm, which in my eyes is the future paradigm, the paradigm that is derived from this ancient narrative is a reconceptualization uh, of female sexuality as a source of power, self-actualization uh, self, uh, <coughs> and empowerment. Amazingly, uh, this is a lesson that, uh, that uh, Biblical Root can teach us in uh, 2020, a lesson that when learned, will be able to move us uh, forward. Thank you. 
minute. And not, there we go. <laughs> I'd love Thank to you. hear. Um, I think we suffer from Golda's syndrome. Every time we're asked to reach out and challenge the issue, the automatic answer is, but Golda. Golda was one of the first women to become head of state in the world. This was back in 1969. When she led her party to general elections, she broke a record and got 56 seats in the Knesset, something no leader managed to do since. But she was also branded by leading the most costly war since the War of Independence. And we, the women of Israel, are held accountable for what is considered as Golda's failure. So every time we ask, when will we have a woman prime minister? The immediate quest answer is Golda. As if saying, you already had your chance to have a woman as prime minister and she failed. So you can't have another one. As if all the men that served as prime ministers since were exceptionally successful and we're all praised for that. But we should not hold ourselves from striving, monitoring, pushing for that. Even if this only stems from the fact that we are half of the population, this is our very fundamental right. We don't have to explain why. How do we do that? We support, encourage, and push women, women to go to politics, express their minds, not be afraid, and not bend their views. We should challenge the system all the time and never give up. Like those roots who did not give up and managed to leave their legacy, we, will, we still have to remember them and speak about them and see them as role models. But in Israel, in Israeli context, we should not forget two important facts. First, Israel is the only democracy that did not, did not separate the state from religion, which is a major source of discrimination and inequality. In our political system, there are still parties that exclude women from running for office. And these parties are legitimate candidates for serving in the coalition. Actually, these parties were part of the coalition and the government ever since the creation of the state. In that context, it is almost impossible to push forward liberal views and legislations. And in this context, the giving, and giving these political realities, it would be extremely challenging to see a woman managing and to overcome these barriers and leading the country. And the other obstacles, of course, is the fact that Israel is engaged in a military um, conflict uh, ever since its creation. And that also shadows all the uh, ability of women to, to succeed uh, through the um, political or leadership uh, corridors. So if I may be a little bit uh, pessimistic, if we don't push for <laughs> really, really full force in these two elements, um, well, I don't know. I'm not very pessimistic. I'm not very optimistic about that. And I, I'm not commenting about the American uh, uh, political system because, well, although I lived there for several years, I'm, I'm not an expert about the political system in America. Okay, well, I hope the next question will allow you to be a bit more optimistic. <laughs> um, so just before I get to my next question, I just want to encourage everyone, please write your questions in the chat box and we will be presenting them to our panelists. Um, so. For my next question, um, and really looking at it from more of an optimistic lens, uh, one key element that stands out in the management or mismanagement of the global crisis that we're currently enduring is the phenomenal results of women leadership. And we see it both uh, locally in Israel and municipalities and cities lead, led by women, and of course, globally. So what I would like to ask is, what do you think is the secret sauce that women have that makes them as such, or us as such good leaders? And I'd like to start with Professor Almo. Well, again, I'm going to be very brief. I think that uh, the leaders who managed to tame the virus juxtapose uh, resourcefulness, resilience, and creativity. 
and uh, perhaps women more than men are prone to produce such complex uh, accumulation which as we are all uh, obviously witness transforms them into better leaders i wish uh, in the future we will be fortunate enough to have such female leaders but uh, alas i'm not optimistic <laughs> So now or not, you have to be optimistic. <laughs> well, let's see. <laughs> or try. I, I won't be very popular here, I think. <laughs> because I'm not sure I can say that women are exceptional leaders. I think we should not strive to be exceptional. We should strive to be ourselves. Fortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, not all women come in the same shape, size, form, image color or whatever. We are different, we have different views and opinions, and we must have the safe space to express our minds without bending. This is why I take, this is what I take from these three models of women who were called Ruth, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Ruth Gabison, and the original biblical Ruth. Be yourself. Women are not a sector, and we are entitled to choose our own way. We are entitled to be wrong, to make mistakes, and to do it right, just like men. Mm. Unfortunately, and as a liberal feminist, I'm sorry that this is the reality lately, we see more and more conservative women who couple with other conservative forces in the society um, or the political corridors and together lead us to what I see as a path of inequality. We see some of our achievements uh, as a feminist movement being pushed aside, eliminated, or just ignored. More and more women get benefits from playing the conservative game, pushing other women down the ladder, back to where they were, we were decades ago. I see this, this as, a do, as a dangerous trend. And when this is the case, I don't think I will support any woman just because she is a woman. I want to support and help women to share, to share the, the same views who hold liberal ideas and help promote equality for all women in our society, not only for strong women, not only for Jewish women, not only for conservative women. Every woman should have the same right in a country and in a society that is a mix of nationalities, ethnic groups, political sectors, I want to see that all have the same opportunity. Equal opportunity is not a slogan. This should, be, this should not be an ornament or an accessory. This should be the core segment of the policy. This idea should be reflected in our reality. Here, here. Professor Imalta, thank you. So, um, as, a as the last commentator, uh, allow me to rephrase the question a bit and ask, how do you become an effective uh, pursuer of equality and justice? Or simply, how one becomes an effective uh, feminist uh, leader? Uh, if I focus again on RBG, uh, she wasn't born a feminist leader. She became one because of her real life experiences. Her consciousness as a grown up person was shaped in a very gendered and patriarchal world. RBG graduated there first in her class at Columbia Law School in 1959. Still, when she was recommended for clerkship with Supreme Court Justice uh, Felix uh, Frankfurter, Frankfurter responded that he wasn't ready to hire a woman. Eventually, RBG joined the faculty of Rutgers Law School, but her status as a woman still put her at a disadvantage. She soon discovered that her salary was lower than that of her male colleagues. What I'm trying to say is that RBG was driven by her own experiences with sex discrimination, and these experiences made her such an effective advocate of gender equality. 
As I said earlier, many of the patriarchal aspects of the world in which RBG's feminist consciousness has been shaped still persist. One look at the G20 leaders with only one woman at the table uncovers the gravity of the problem, especially uh, as we focus on the current uh, global crisis of COVID-19. A recent report on the issue of gender and decision-making found that women politicians uh, politicians more often bring uh, attention to issues such as gender-based violence, family-friendly policies, and more generally uh, responsiveness to citizens' needs. This doesn't mean, and I now I respond to a not that all women are like this, right? But it is more likely that women politicians would be uh, uh, like this. So in other words, uh, mainstreaming gender equality is an essential part of the road to recovery from COVID-19. Yet to ensure gender equal decision making in all political bodies, significant changes still need to take place at the current rate of progress. It will take 200 years or nine generations to achieve full gender equality. Since we don't have 200 years to eliminate discriminatory norms and to guarantee women's equal uh, participation in the public sphere, more women, liberal women, of course, need to step in and to become activists and models for others. And I must end with one of RBG's famous quotes. It has been quoted repeatedly since her death but it is so relevant to the topic we discussed today that I must remind us all once again, her ultimate advice for all present and future women leaders, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. Thank you. Thank you. I thought you were going to use the quote of uh, all that we are asking of our brethren is to keep their, uh, their what is it, their knees off our necks? <laughs> it was a hard choice, hard choice. <laughs> That's another good one. So thank you. Um, I'm going to start taking, uh, we have some questions from the participants. And again, I want to encourage everyone to ask um, questions to any and all of our panelists. Um, and I also want to draw your attention, we're going to be putting a link for a short feedback form. If you could please take two minutes to fill it out, it'd be much appreciated. So now um, we'll go to the question. So Shmuel is asking, and I hope I understood his question, um, and he's saying this is addressed to all panelists, is what do you think of perhaps um, exchanging the term feminism with the term gender equality? Because Again, if I understood him correctly, feminism sometimes, the term feminism creates stereotypes of female hatred against males. And he says that maybe if feminist movements and organizations would replace it with gender equality, maybe the struggle for rights of women would become more effective. I hope I represented that question clearly. So does any one of you want to start, jump on that? Um. I can jump. I'm already ready to jump. So, <laughs> um, so first, there is no distinction what to, whatsoever, in my opinion, between gender equality and feminism. The, this feminism is about the struggle for gender equality. It is very true, and Shmuel is very correct, that the greatest success of uh, patriarchy is um, in labeling feminism in such a negative way, right? So, so many women are trying to distance themselves from the term feminism as if this, uh, 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 because it is associated with so, so many negative um, uh, aspects, right? In people's minds, uh, so feminism sounds like the hatred of men or a bunch of aggressive women now ready to start a fight. Um, so, and this is very unfortunate, right? Because really feminism is um, 
um, is the promise of justice uh, and equality for all. Feminism is for men. And once we start internalizing this, we will be able to push our society to a much, uh, much better place. Can I add to what uh, I just said? Uh, we have to acknowledge, I agree to everything you said, but we have to acknowledge that the feminist movement was one of the great successes of the 20th century in terms of um, uh, the whole social change. I mean, we cannot underestimate that these achievements, although we, are, we haven't achieved uh, full uh, equity, we can still celebrate what we did, I mean, what other women did in the last hundred years. So we have to, to acknowledge that and we have to understand that yes, it takes time and it's, it's a struggle for equality for the society. It's not equality for women. It's, it's really a social change movement. This is something that we have to internalize and understand that it's not feminism for women. I mean, it's not women's issues as, as Noah said it right. It's, it's something that we all should internalize and mainstream it for all of us, for all the society. This is a social change um, a struggle. Thank you, Anna. Professor Almog, do you wanna? I, let's go to the next question. I don't have anything uh, okay. to add to this uh, brilliant things that were said by my colleagues. Okay, so I will ask one more question we have now from the audience and then I will uh, turn the mic to Shlomit who also has uh, a question. Um, Actually, I need to ask this question from uh, Lisa Jaffe from HBI, which I know very well. Uh, Lisa writes that uh, female presidential candidates in the United States have to manage conflicting gender norms that provide no model for an appealing and acceptable female leader. Trump's success in 2016, she writes, was in part because so many, including women, found Hillary ambition, manner, and gender performance unappealing. Other female candidates have faced similar challenges. What are the gender norms that Israeli prime minister candidates must manage? So in other words, what are, how can you have a woman president when you don't have adequate role models for this position? Uh, Anat, you want to start? First of all, we do have role models, world role models, very good ones. I mean, Angela Merkel for, for one and the Jacinda Ardern for the second one. We, ha we have role models in the world. Problem is, as someone wrote here in the chat, that when we see a woman as a, as a, as a role model, we want her to be everything. We want her to be liberal enough and conservative enough and young and old and experienced and exceptional and ordinary and educated. I mean, we want to have everything in one figure and this is impossible. It doesn't come in, in male and it doesn't come in female. So that's the problem. The problem is our high expectations from a woman that when she becomes head of state or the leader, she should be so exceptional. She, should, she shouldn't have any weaknesses. It doesn't exist. I mean, it's it's not utopia. It doesn't exist. We have to not. We have to lower lower our expectations. We have to be realistic about what's going on. And, and I mean, this is this is the magic of democracy that everybody can be a leader. Everybody can be elected for office. But uh, but preferably, uh, usually it's a man unfortunately shulamit do you have uh, a yeah, can, can i jump in because uh, i must say that i completely agree with anat and uh, i will take it further and say that i think that the um, expectation for from women and not uh, particularly women leaders from any woman from any from all the women in the world is part of the problem and uh, a major part of this is the things that women expect from themselves uh, women uh, usually put strings upon themselves uh, they are prone to restraints and to limitation that men uh, are free from and until 
women will somehow free themselves from these inner limits, I think that the way will be blocked. I think that part of the part of the uh, solution to the huge problem that still exists, and we are uh, as far from solving it today as we were uh, many years ago, is to change something very basic uh, in the way that women are, um, are kind of taught to be women or become women, to, to paraphrase uh, the old saying of Simone de Beauvoir, until this changes and this uh, borders between uh, the gender borders between men and the women will evaporate, I'm afraid that uh, the solution will stay uh, very far from our future. Um, I would just add that um, um, it's very true that it's much harder for women politicians. Um, research uh, suggests that um, for men politician to be elected, it's enough if he's competent. Women are subjected to a second standard. They need to be likable. What is likable, right? It's, it's, it's very difficult. This is one of the reasons uh, why Hillary Clinton lost and why so many female politicians are having such a hard time. It's just a harsher standard that it's almost impossible uh, to meet. And I, I mentioned that Trump was elected partially because of the votes of 52% uh, of white women. And it's not a secret that women are the facilitators of their own subjection and their own oppression, right? We are 51% of the population, right? Without us, this entire patriarchal operation could not exist. So we are the enablers of the entire project. And it's time to realize that, uh, right, that it starts, I mean, we should change uh, um, a, 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 the rules of the games. And this involves a real change in consciousness, right? So because some women are transformed by their life experiences, just like RBG turned into feminists, some are not, they internalize masculine norms and patriarchal norms and they are become the oppressors and something has to be changed, right? So as I said, we have a long, long way to go. Well, that's not uh, the greatest news, but definitely a, a realistic view, but life is full of surprises and definitely uh, currently uh, we have uh, uh, examples of women who make history one after the other and great changes, uh, especially in Europe. So there is a uh, hope and uh, hopefully we won't have to wait 200 years as you suggested, uh, Noya, but uh, the change will come uh, in our lifestyles and we can bring the change as well. Noa, you have like more questions up your sleeves? I have one more question that I was thinking about, and, and uh, Professor Rimalt, you mentioned it before, and, and I think Anat also uh, touched upon it, because um, I know that one of the things that RBG was famously saying is that this is not obviously a battle that is a, a women's battle, or as, or as Hillary Clinton said, human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights. Um, what can we expect, I mean, what, what we'd like ideally for, for men to do, we all know, I think, but how is there a pragmatic way to get them, and I hate calling it them, but to get them on, on board in, in helping realize that, as you said, and I, and I, I stand corrected on that with what you said, I think I'm going to end here more pessimistic than I am optimistic. But as you said, it's not that it's a default that if you're a woman, you're better. Just to be equal is, is obviously good enough because we'll all get you know, the same opportunities. But seeing as men have a, a, an important role to play here as fathers, husbands, um, and generally in society. I, I'd love to hear your take on, on what we can expect or how we can help them help us, so to speak. Uh, maybe we should start uh, talking about masculinity and not uh, feminism, you know? Maybe we should start, really, maybe we should start 
talking about the new man or um, bring into the uh, discussion new ideas that will engage more men into the discourse because otherwise we talk, may, most of the time we talk to ourselves. And I think the, the first uh, question referred to that. What's his name? Shmuel, I think. And by the way, sorry, it's predominantly women here in the participants. Uh, there you go. There you yeah. go. So, uh, and so it's, it's like a loop that feeds itself. I mean, we speak about ourselves to ourselves and, you know, it's an ongoing loop and we have to broader our, our uh, circles and open it up and be ready for criticism because I think in a way feminism is stuck. It has not been in progress for many years and we're still very much stuck in the head counting method and it's no longer applicable. I mean, it's boring, it's not applicable and it doesn't bring in new ideas to the, to the public debate. So if we start speaking about masculinity and you know, masculinity versus femininity and stuff like that, this may you know, bring in more men to the, to the table. You don't think that could have, but there may be a counter, a counter effect. Maybe, but we have, we're strong enough to 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 I don't know to to manage that. But we shouldn't be we shouldn't be threatened by that. Yeah. Thank well, you. I think that uh, more and more men uh, really wish to be redeemed uh, from uh, toxic uh, masculinity these days. I mean, men also face uh, demands that sometimes are very hard to accommodate. Uh, demands that are, uh, that are born from the restrictive uh, uh, societal convention and uh, uh, such convention are hard sometimes upon men, not only upon women. And I think that a uh, that, uh, uh, word with equality should be beneficial not only for uh, for women but also for uh, young men and for for the next future and I, I don't know how exactly can we achieve a kind of discourse that will enable it but I only know we should not stop we should not tire and we should go on with with acts and with activities similar to the one that we are engaged in right now. By the way, before I pass it on to, uh, to Professor Rimal, just to say I was talking about echo chambers. And this goes to say, again, we're, we're right now in our own echo chamber where we're all nodding and agreeing with one another, but that doesn't help us break out into, into where we want to make a change. Yes. So uh, I would just add that, um, as was already uh, mentioned, everything starts at home, right? Uh, what children see at home, the division of labor they are uh, uh, exposed to, the roles their parents play in their lives. One of the favorite stories about RBG, and I keep on returning uh, to this amazing woman, one of the favorite stories about her, uh, you know that she was happily married for almost uh, 60 years. Um, her husband was a great cook. So all her interns and this law student, they always said that whenever they visited the couple uh, in their home, so Martin was always cooking. And once um, the couple was asked, what is the secret to their happy marriage? And Martin said, it's very, very simple. She doesn't keep, uh, give me advices on cooking and I don't give her advices on the law, right? So when, right, this is the way to start, right? When the division of labor at home changes significantly. And as women, you know, enter, are able to enter the public sphere um, and, and dominate uh, more significant uh, positions of power and influence. And that is what young children are going uh, uh, to see from day one. This is when our world uh, will start changing.
you know, the continuation of that story, I just read it recently, is that their daughter was asked what the division of labor is at home. So she said, dad does the cooking and mom does the thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I think when we'll reach that place, we'll definitely be, uh, we'll know we're on our oh. way. This is a little discouraging. I mean, the only thing a woman must do is be lucky enough to find uh, a spouse who cooks. But if she doesn't, well... There was also an article said why every woman needs to, needs to find a Marty Ginsburg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He also obviously played a role in that. Okay. So there's a question here. How can we convince men which I'm not sure that uh, um, I follow. How can we convince men to give up their power and privileges and become gender equality advocates? And I would suggest that men won't give up most of them anyway, their privileges, but women will learn how to take them. So uh, Shulamit, what do you think about this, uh, this question? Uh, as I said before, yeah, Women must learn, must insist on taking it. But uh, since uh, we are uh, low in gender form, uh, I must emphasize the role of the law. We must have laws. We must have new laws. We must have new reforms that will change things, that will enable more and more women to get into more and more powerful positions. And I know that uh, we know that law is problematic because law is uh, allegedly uh, neutral, but it hides uh, deep structures of, uh, of uh, power allocation. It hides uh, privileging men for many, many years. Uh, and it's difficult to, to change this very deep structure. But it is, start, it is starting to change. Laws are everywhere. State uh, principles of equality and give tools and more and more tools, more and more laws will be changed in, over, in, in order to widen the arsenal that will be open to women. So, uh, and now I'm turning to be optimistic. The combination of these two uh, mechanisms of legal change together with uh, the change in the, in the perception of uh, women, of first of children, of young uh, girls. For example, uh, this, this uh, project that uh, we uh, started a few weeks ago of the convention that will tell very young uh, girls about their rights. I think that together such tools uh, will be able to promote the goal we are all talking about here. Definitely, there's great hope in youth and like new feminism, which really uh, changes the world. It's a milestone that we are celebrating three years to Me Too. And we see online girls, young girls even, and uh, women, young women who are not accepting anymore what maybe we used to accept as in that, in, you know, as the way of things are. Uh, Noya, do you have a comment on that question? I, I just want to, to, to repeat what I said earlier, gender norms and expectations can be oppressive to men, right? Not all men are power seekers in the sense that not all of them want to be the primary breadwinners. Uh, some of them would like to stay home and raise their children. They suffer just like women from uh, being um, uh, subjected uh, to these expectations. And I think, I'm, I'm, and, 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 and I'm, allow me to be a bit optimistic. I haven't been until now, right? But I mean, if I look around, I see a growing number of men who finally understand that, um, uh, that this, there, there is a promise of freedom here, right? And as a greater number of men understand this and join us, and I think this will happen eventually, as this is a very oppressive world for both genders. So as this happens, um, change uh, will be uh, more, more evident. 
Thank you. Uh, Anat, will men give up their power and privileges and join the march? Or what, what do you think? First of all, men are, should be our allies. And then I think this will happen when the center of our lives will not be um, our, our job. This will not be the center of our identity. Once we understand that our identity is 360 degrees and, and our job is only one part of it, and the other parts are our family and our children, if we have children, our partners, our um, um, friends, you know, so the, the job that we do is not the centerpiece of our identity, then everything will be more balanced. And I think that the, uh, the, the Corona, the COVID uh, crisis is a huge example or experience that we should, we should learn from because everybody's home and we, we experience two uh, polarizing uh, trends. One is of course the, uh, the rise in, in um, domestic violence, which is horrible and we should, we should address that. But the other thing is that men are more at home and they are more engaged in the family and in, in the, in the um, uh, traditional duties that women do usually. And they are more engaged in the raising their children. They meet their children in, in hours that they've never seen them in. And, and I think this should be something that we should take to the future. If I may, you know, wrap with something optimistic from this, COVID crisis, I think this may be something because it's, it's, it's been on for so long that it's, it's, uh, it's sinking into our, our life experience. And we, we, maybe it will change somehow our society, our perceptions, our worldviews. I, I do hope so. Thank you. So one final question that we received and then we'll wrap up. Um, Chris asked um, that, I think it's, I don't know if it's, I guess it's her, him, but it might be her, so I apologize. I agree to some extent with that it starts at home, but we can also enable changes at, at home through legislation. And that's how we did it in Sweden. It took a hundred years and the changes were incremental. It's still not perfect, but it's much better. Any take on that from any of you? Just say that in my next life, I want to be born as a Swedish uh, woman. <laughs> <laughs> You'll for sure be more of an optimist. <laughs> yes, I, I can say that uh, Sweden is uh, a very interesting example. They are always first. Uh, for example, the laws uh, about uh, um, prostitution, they started uh, before any of us uh, was thinking about what is now known as the Nordic uh, model. The perception uh, of prostitution that we introduced in Israel just a few uh, months ago is uh, stating that uh, prostitution is uh, illegal but uh, women in prostitution are victims and only um, they are called uh, customers, they are to be criminalized. So it's all started in Sweden uh, more than uh, uh, 20 years ago and uh, many other countries followed. Uh, also the uh, social uh, welfare laws in Sweden uh, the equality laws in Sweden are very progressive and they set a model for uh, many countries for many years. And lastly, well, this is still uh, to be seen how successful they really are, but uh, as we know, their uh, attitude towards uh, COVID is also quite innovative. And uh, it is still debatable whether they, uh, they know more than any other country. Uh, but uh, they go on with their, uh, with their uh, um, let's say, uh, their tendency to do everything uh, different. <laughs> and I'm also for the Swedes. So um, 
putting Sweden on the table force me, uh, forces me to end uh, with a more critical note. So it's true that Sweden has achieved a lot uh, with regard to gender equality, but they haven't made it yet, I must say. Um, um, I conducted a very extensive research on the Nordic model, and it's true that they have a very long parental leave for both parents. It's true that they have what they call daddy quota, right? That they force men to take part of the parental leave. So we do see men at home raising children. That's true. But if you study the, the, the figures more critically, what you see that out of a very, very long parental leave that can last up to two years, women still take most of the leave and women still pay in terms of their progress uh, in the workforce. They still earn less than men. So um, Sweden, great, but not, uh, not a perfect model. It's not clearly uh, working and it's not really breaking the core issue of the very gendered uh, division of work at home. I agree, but still some things to learn from them. I mean, some achievements that we will welcome here in Israel. <laughs> Compared to Israel and the United States, definitely Sweden is like 10 steps forward, no doubt about it. Okay, um, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Um, I did wanna say that Eileen wrote a remark that uh, she said it's an excellent presentation, but it's a topic that could be expanded and discussed endlessly. And we of course agree. Um, and that we need to make sure that the conversation isn't just binary anymore, that obviously we need to bring in um, men into this conversation. Having said that, I will say that I was very proud that even without trying, we got an all-female panel and moderators. Um, I wish the participants were a bit more, uh, it, were not so homogenic, but we'll, we'll take what we can get and we'll, we'll try to push ahead. So with that being said, a big, big thank you to Professor Rimald and Professor Almog and to Anat Saragusti for taking their time for preparing for this uh, panel and for being with us here tonight. And thank you for the Forum for Law and Gender, sorry, the Forum for Gender, Law and Policy um, of Haifa University. We both share the uh, auspices of the Faculty of Law. Um, and a big thank you to Shlomit Lea for partnering with us and for helping us uh, put this all together and make it happen. And thank you last but by no means least to all of you. And one last time I will nag and ask if you could please fill out the feedback form. Um, and then to wish you all a good night. And Shlomit, any final remarks? Yeah, thank you, Noah. Thank you, Professor Almog, Anatza Regusti, Professor Rimalt, and thank you all for joining us today in this inspiring event. We will keep you updated on future events, and I would say that together we will promote women power and change the world. Nothing less is acceptable. Thank you. Amen.